Well, good morning, and thanks again, Mark, for that gracious introduction. It's always an honor to be here, and I really enjoy getting out and visiting um, as many of our 140 churches in the Northwest Conference that I can. Um, I, I joke, and I, I reflect with a, um, a holy amazement that when I felt God call me to ministry at 17, um, I thought I'd be a youth pastor for life, and never did I imagine that conference or denominational leadership, would this would lead to that. It was such a curious turn of events. And, um, and I've always tried to pay attention to um, walking through the doors that open and paying attention to the ones that close because blo- both provide clarity. And over the years of working with pastors, I've, I've counseled many pastors and leaders who are wondering about, is it time for a change? Is it time for something else? And, and I've reflected deeply on this idea that throughout scripture, um, God is always calling people out to do things right before they feel ready. <laughs> um, you know, nobody ever that I've seen feels fully prepared for what God's inviting them to. There's always a fair amount of, really, God, is this what we're doing? I don't know. And, and so it's in that spirit that I step into this role as superintendent, yet um, I'm, I fully know that, that God is with me, God is with us. Uh, there are times of incredible opportunity and challenge ahead, and I'm excited and, and ready to dive in. So thank you for your support. Thanks for the invitation to be here. Uh, I'm looking forward to this next season. Uh, well, one of the things uh, going on in my re- life recently is uh, we bought a house because it's a great time to buy a house. Um, you should all do it right now. <laughs> uh, we finally decided to move. And so I was sitting on our new front porch, catching up on some work, and a young woman came up, to, uh, drove up, and confidently walked up to the front steps where I was sitting. I was actually on a phone call, and she just kept trying to get my attention. And she said, uh, are you Emily? And I said, No. And she looked a little disappointed, but she said, are you selling puppies? And I said, no. And she burst into tears. Now, if this were some sort of a mystery novel or something, this would be, you know, the setup of a really interesting story. Um, But the real story was very tragic uh, because she had just driven three hours from a nearby town and she had paid $900 for a golden doodle puppy that I did not have because I don't sell golden doodle puppies. And in her car was dog food and a kennel and a leash and all the things. And as the reality of what was happening sank in, we were both together just overwhelmed by how sad and tragic the situation was. Uh, It was a scam. She had fallen for a scam. And actually, these are very common uh, online with with puppies right now, as as you know. So um, I offered her a beverage and sat with her while she filled out a police report and, and filed an online report. And she was so embarrassed and just dreaded the thought of going to work the next day, because this was gonna be an office dog, apparently. She was gonna bring it to work. And she was just going through in her mind all the people she was gonna have to face and tell what happened. And we both knew she's probably not gonna get her money back. We both knew this person or people or ring of whatever on the other side of the computer would likely not be brought to justice. And this thing was so, so tragic. Because there's the reality that there's this person or group of people on the other end of the computer who spent their days and their life creating scams to take advantage of people, taking their hard-earned money, frustrating lives, wasting people's time, crushing children's dreams, destroying people's hope and humanity, and living in the shadows. And it was highly unlikely that they would be caught, and it was highly likely that they were making a lot of money doing this. And that's so, so frustrating. And the story that I just shared with you, very true story, um, illustrates so much of what is happening in our text this morning with Psalm 37. The realities of living in a world where evil prospers and flourishes. And then addressing the question of what is our Christian response to a world like that? I was invited invited to preach on a psalm that was meaningful to me. And as I flipped through my Bible, I realized this was quickly like choosing a favorite child because so many of them were highlighted and marked up. And you can see, I like to use my Bible, you know? (laughs) Um, I'm a fan of of writing in your Bible. Um, It's hard to be a good student of scripture on your phone if it's entirely on your phone, right? So I like to write and underline things. And this psalm is really marked up in my Bible. And I have a big July 2020 written next to it. Uh, If you remember our world in July 2020, there was a lot going on. 
We're coming to grips with the global pandemic in a summer of everything being canceled. Uh, we were in the aftermath of the death of George Floyd and what all of that meant for our, our city and our, our world. Um, and life was frustrating. And this psalm provided great comfort and perspective to me at that time. And so I, I share that with you because our world hasn't really gotten any less complicated since then. So it's a long psalm. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but if you have your scripture, uh, your Bible, or an app on your phone, please follow along. Um, and I'll just, read, I'll just read parts of this to give you a taste of what David the psalmist is, is getting at with this psalm. Starting out with verse one, he says, do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your, right, your righteousness reward, excuse me, your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. Verse 23, the Lord makes firm the steps of those who delight in him. Though they stumble, they will not fall, for the Lord upholds, him, upholds them with his hand. Verse 39, he closes with this, the salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is the stronghold in times of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. And the psalm goes, goes back and forth. Um, it, it reads more like uh, the book of Proverbs. Um, so it's written in a series of couplets or two lines. It's 40 verses long. It's got 20, 22 couplets, I think. Um, short, short little verses. And it reads like practical wisdom literature, like again, you would find in Proverbs. Uh, many of the Psalms that you'll study this summer are prayers to God. Uh, this is not a prayer. This is, this is wisdom uh, literature. It's instruction. It's exhortation. Uh, and again, it's very, very practical. In the Psalm, there are clear distinctions between two groups of people, the wicked and the righteous, um, which are not words we use a whole lot, right? Unless you're from out east, something is wicked awesome, right? <laughs> Mark knows this. Um, so it's talking about these groups of people, two assemblies. Um, the wicked care nothing for God, only concerned with themselves. And the righteous people are who the psalmist is instructing in this passage. These people who are seeking to be faithful to God. The righteous are also described in this psalm as meek, upright, blameless. And by blameless, we don't mean those who live without sin, only Jesus can do that, but those who live with integrity or try to live with integrity. And note the significant contrast between these two groups of people that, as they're described in this psalm. A quick glance through the psalm shows the wicked described as evil, doing wrong. They will wither like grass. They have wicked schemes. They will be destroyed. They're plotting, gnashing teeth, drawing the sword and bending the bow. So they're ready to fight. They will perish. They're the Lord's enemies. They will go up in smoke. They borrow and do not repay. They are cursed. They are wrongdoers, they will be destroyed, they're murderous, and they have no future. Those are some harsh words to describe this group of people that the psalmist is talking about. Meanwhile, in contrast, the righteous, or the people that the psalm is written to, to instruct them in how to live in this world, the righteous are described as dwelling in the land and enjoying safe pasture, taking delight in the Lord, committed, trusting, Reward, they will receive reward. Be still, patient, non-angry or anxious, hopeful, meek, peaceful, prosperous, upheld by God, blameless, under the Lord's care. It goes on, they will receive an inheritance, enduring forever, generous, blessed. They will have firm steps. Children are a blessing, good and loved by God, faithful, they have wisdom, they are just, their feet do not slip, Hopeful, blameless, upright, having a future. They are peace-seeking, helped and delivered by the Lord, taking refuge in God. Isn't that quite the contrast between these two groups? 
And I know which type of person I hope to strive to be. Yet there are passages in this psalm that clearly acknowledge the flourishing of the wicked in that first group. Verse 35 says, I have seen the wicked and ruthless flourishing like a luxuriant native tree, but they soon passed away and were no more. The psalm also compares the wicked to the beauty of the fields, spectacular, but temporary. Whereas the righteous people as described and addressed in this psalm would look forward to a permanent inheritance. There's this contrast between something that's maybe um, spectacular as described in the psalm, but temporary versus having a permanent inheritance in the Lord. This acknowledgement that the, that the wicked can temporarily flourish is the stuff of real life, isn't it? And it addresses this tension in the psalm. How do we live as Christ followers in a world where it seems like the bad guys are winning a lot? The bad guys are winning a lot in this world. And how, do more, how more broadly, how do we as Christians maintain a steady faithfulness in times of difficulty? These are real questions, aren't they? And the psalm gives us guidance, I think, as we live into this reality. The first thing the psalmist says starts in verse one. He says, do not fret. And the used fret literally is translated, do not become enraged. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. There's a time and a place for righteous anger. And scripture speaks to this. And don't get me wrong, there's plenty to be mad about in our world. The psalm is not an invitation to turn a blind eye to the hard things and the injustices in our world and say, well, my life is comfortable, so I'm not gonna worry about that stuff. That's not what the psalm is saying. Instead, this psalm is giving an invitation to not let anger get the best of us, to not let our rage consume us, and to not let our lives be consumed by this anger. In other words, don't play their game. Don't sink to their level. Do not fret, is what the psalmist is saying. I was reflecting on how and where I've seen this played out uh, in my life or in the world, and the the clearest illustration that just jumped to mind for me uh, was when last fall I had the opportunity to go on a Sankofa experience. Uh, Sankofa means look back to look forward. And this is an opportunity that the Evangelical Covenant Church offers. We hop on a bus, you're paired with someone of another race than you, and you take a tour of the deep south, and you experience um, many of the sites um, that, were, that were meaningful during the civil rights movement, and you relive a lot of our history. So for four days, I was on a bus in the deep south, and we heard stories and retraced the steps of the, the Freedom Riders, and we visited museums and landmarks, um, including a, an incredibly meaningful museum, um, a new museum from the Equal Justice Initiative. This is Brian Stevenson's work, if you're familiar with him, that traced the history of the, the transatlantic slave trade to slavery in America, to lynching, to Jim Crow laws, to the civil rights movement, to now mass incarceration in our country. And you would not be shocked to learn that the overwhelming response to the people in our group and everyone who goes through, through this museum is anger. How can human beings treat each other this way? Um, I mean, there, there really is no other response than, than to simply just be, be angry about this and the injustices in our world and the, and the, the history of our, of our nation. And in the face of such oppression and anger and hatred, it was equally amazing to me to learn about the stories of, of many of these civil rights leaders who didn't respond with an equal amount of hate, but with a posture of nonviolence. In the face of such, a, such oppression, there were, there were leaders who were leading these movements who, who responded with a posture of nonviolence. And this was amazing to me. Uh, John Lewis, who received a skull fracture in the march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, where a group of people were marching from Selma to Montgomery to advocate for voting rights, even said, never let anyone, any person or any force dampen, dim or diminish your light. Release the need to hate, <laughs> to harbor division and the enticement of revenge. Release all bitterness, hold only love, only peace in your heart, knowing that the battle of good to overcome evil is already won. Wow. And this was one of many violent encounters through this movement, and yet many of these civil rights leaders continue to advocate 
for a nonviolent approach and a nonviolent response to all of this hatred um, they were experiencing and that we still see. Uh, it's not because they weren't mad. There's plenty to be mad about, as I said. We still have a lot of work to do. But even Martin Luther King said it well, who was jailed and assaulted and, and faced incredible opposition. He said, let no man pull you so low as to hate him. And in the face of such violent and hateful opposition, these examples of leaders who made a conscious decision to not stoop down to the level of those who wanted to cause them harm was incredibly inspiring to me. And this message that they were giving and modeling and preaching was so in line with the message of Jesus Christ, who invited us to love our enemies and invited us to turn the other cheek. The Apostle Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians 4.1. He acknowledges how hard it is. And he says it's because, because of God's mercy that we even have this ministry, and we all have a ministry that God has called us to. It is through God's mercy that we do not lose heart. And later on in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, outwardly we are wasting away, but inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary struggles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal. Paul picks up this theme of following Christ's example in Philippians 2 with an admonition for all of us to follow with Christ's example of the suffering servant. The Apostle Paul writes the book of Philippians from jail where he is being persecuted and oppressed and he reflects on the example of Jesus Christ and instructs us to, in our relationships with one another, have the same attitude of mind that Christ Jesus had, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, Rather, he made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant. And he humbled himself, even becoming obedient to death on a cross. This is a difficult invitation that, that scripture is inviting us to, that the psalmist is suggesting here in Psalm 37, and that the apostle Paul picks up and is modeled so clearly through the life, the life of Christ. Because it doesn't make a whole lot of logical sense. When someone is persecuting you and, and is treating you unjustly, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to respond with, with love or nonviolence. And this, this invitation, this, this invitation to us to not let rage consume us is only possible through the transformative work of Jesus Christ in our lives, through the transformative power of the Holy Spirit in and through us. This is the only way uh, we can get to this place of not fretting in the face of injustice. The second thing I wanna point out about this passage is that we are invited to take the long view on this. We remember that the Lord is just and the Lord sees the injustice in the world. God allows the flourishing of the wicked temporarily because God sees the big picture. The Psalm doesn't get into the theological or philosophical defense of why there's evil in the world. You're not gonna find that in Psalm 37. Um, but it states that evil is there and it names the tension uh, between those who do evil and are also thriving temporarily and those who are trying to be faithful to God. And again, we are invited to take the long view. The Lord sees the big picture and we are given just this tiny little slice, which is what we're living right now in this moment. The psalmist reminds us that the Lord will deal with things and we are to be patient and wait on the Lord because the Lord sees what's going on. God may not act as quickly as we would like, but God sees, God knows, God cares, and God will act. In verse two, the psalm sets up the comparison that the wicked are like grass, a reminder that even though they may be flourishing today, by tomorrow they will be gone, they will wither away. And in a Middle Eastern climate, and even in some summers in Minnesota, our grass will start out as green and lush in the spring, in the spring and a reminder that by mid-July, it's crunchy and withered. <laughs> this is a tangible reminder of, of how the Lord sees the, the wicked in our world. And I wanna point out one more thing. Note the use of the word will in this Psalm. The Lord will. This is a promise, it's a concrete promise. Verse two, the evil ones will wither. Verse four, the Lord will give you the desires of your heart. Verse six, he will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn. Verse nine, those who are evil will be destroyed, while those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. 
Verse 10, in a little while, the wicked will be no more. Verse 11, the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. And it goes on and on. It's a future hope that's grounded in the present reality. And the word will is the trump card in the hand of the righteous. Because we know who holds the future. We are assured that the flourishing of evil in this world is temporary. So we can trust the Lord. And to those who would push back and say, well, yeah, that's just a really easy Sunday school answer, you know, really easy Sunday school answer in, in difficult times. Um, sure, <laughs> you're right. And yet, what else are we gonna do? This is what we've been invited to do, to trust the Lord. A few verses in here talk about how the faithful will inherit the land, their children will not go hungry, etc. This is not a prosperity gospel type thing, but rather it's an invitation to trust the Lord with all the pieces of our lives. The Lord will be faithful, and the Lord will do what the Lord says. And this is an especially poignant reminder right now to trust the Lord in all areas of our lives. I know a lot of people right now are worried about finances and the financial situation. Um, inflation is the last I heard, eight and a half percent. And I don't know any employers who are giving raises that high to match that. The housing market is bonkers. Gas and food are expensive. And yet, we're invited to trust the Lord. And maybe, and even be generous, as it says a few times uh, in this psalm. Because this is a hallmark of Christ's followers. You're either going to trust the Lord, or you're going to trust yourself or something else. And only the Lord has proven faithful and trustworthy. Finally, the third point that I want to make about this psalm is that we are invited to cultivate faithfulness. The idea of cultivating faithfulness is a spiritual practice, a discipline, and it doesn't happen overnight. But it happens over a lifetime of serving and following the Lord. Spiritual disciplines like, like prayer and fasting and solitude and scripture reading and going to church and worship, it's like compound interest. A little bit invested over a period of time provides significant growth over time. And I found this idea of the practice of cultivating faithfulness to be helpful in times of overwhelming confusion or stress. Um, and we can all name the situations that are confusing and stressful in our lives right now, right? Maybe for you it's a, it's a health diagnosis or a concern with a family member. Maybe somebody you don't like got elected to office or we read about, again, all the, the violence going on in our world. Whatever it is. We throw all these things into this swirling that goes on in our brain and we get overwhelmed and we don't know what to do or where to start or how to, how to help. And so we're invited to cultivate faithfulness in that. I learned a really helpful way to, to practice doing this uh, in seminary. And I'll, and I'll give you this illustration. It's, it's called the circle of concern and the circle of influence. And so imagine with me, or even draw it in your bulletin, draw a big circle. This is your circle of concern. Everything that you are concerned about in the world goes in there. Anything from an upcoming math test to child hunger to whatever else that you're concerned about in the world, it all goes in your circle of concern. Now you can draw a much smaller circle within your circle of concern, and this is your circle of influence. And this is smaller and it's more intentional because this is, these are the things in life that you actually have influence over. Doesn't mean that you're forgetting about all this other stuff. It means you're gonna focus on this circle. And likely this is probably going to just be uh, some family members, some friends, maybe some people you work with, other leadership opportunities you have, you know, it's different for each person. The reason this has been helpful for me is because it's an invitation to cultivate faithfulness in what I have control and influence over. And I give all of it to the Lord in prayer. I, God's got all of it. But what I'm gonna, I'm gonna worry about in this moment is, is this stuff and how, how can I be involved in my circle of influence? What can I do? How can you be faithful to God with what God has called you to do within your circle of influence? And reframing that question for me has been incredibly helpful over the world, or over the years, excuse me. To still hold all of it before the Lord in prayer, give your circle of concern to the Lord and lean into your circle of influence. So I give that to you if it's a, if it's a practical and helpful tool. And through, the, through all of this, I invite you to not fret don't be consumed by this. Take the long view and cultivate faithfulness because the Lord is faithful 
and the Lord is trustworthy. Amen. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious God, thank you so much for the gift we have of coming to you in worship. Thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. Thank you for the gift of your word through scripture. God, I pray that um, as we go through the Psalms this summer, your word will transform lives. You will encourage and equip us to serve you faithfully in a broken and hurting world. God, we love you. We trust you. We ask that you lead us. Help us to be good followers of you. In your name we pray. Amen.